Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was getting ready to say lovely day, then I was going to say no, but you know what? It is a lovely day. God gave it to us, and that makes it lovely. Makes Amen. it very lovely. In fact, <clears throat> please be mindful of our prayer list and those who are on it. Um, I've just been, been told a little earlier that, that Sister Rima is really going through some things, so please uh, uh, keep her in your prayers as well. She's having some health issues. And, we're just asking the Lord to do what needs to be done in regard to her life. And I know she wants to be here, uh, but she's unable right now. So we'll keep her in our prayers and see what the Lord will do with that. Guys, as the Lord allows, we're back, of course, in our study in this great book, <coughs> excuse me, of First Peter. And by way of review, we're going to be at First Peter chapter 2, and I'll begin my reading at verse 20. As it says in your bulletin, and that should be page 1056. I'm sorry, verse 17. First Peter chapter 2, verse 17. I'll begin my reading, and I'll end at verse 20. And again, page 1056 should be the page number. We were given some instructions by Peter, and he was given instructions to this church, and given it to us as well. And he says in verse 17, if you're there, say amen. Amen. He says in verse 12, uh, 17, Honor all men, love the brethren, fear God. And of course, he's talking about reverencing God here. And he says, honor the king. And he's speaking about there, those who are in authority. And a lot of times we get some kings or presidents or mayors or governors who aren't very good. But he says, honor them. And we're more honoring the position than we are the man. As God has them there for his purpose. And whatever needs to be done in regard to discipline, he's going to take care of them. Even some things that we don't know, God knows. And indeed, he's there, there because of him. Verse 18 says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also, it says, to the froward. And look, he's talking about those that it could be your boss, it could be your supervisor, somebody who's in authority over you. And, and some of them are good. We know there are some, we've had some real good bosses, real good supervisors, and, and some are not so good. And you really don't want to listen to them. You want to, don't want to hear them. But he said we're, we're to do good to them as well. And, and, and listen, just whatever the issue is, give it to the Lord. But as long as they're giving us instruction, that does not go against biblical principles. We're to honor them as well. He goes on and, and tells us why. And, and the reason he says in verse 19, for this is thankworthy, for if for a man, uh, toward, for uh, this is thankworthy, if a man, it says, for conscience toward God, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And, and look, there's times when we do suffer wrongfully. There, there are times when we have bosses that are over us that aren't doing right by us. But guys, wherever we are, Frank just kind of brought that to, to our attention in regard to us being on duty 24-7, that we're not just serving people, but we're serving a great God, and we're to do unto him, and, and, and others are blessed because we're doing unto him. Verse 20 says, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted, in other words, punished for your faults, ye take it patiently? And by the way, if you're doing wrong, you should be punished and you should take it patiently. He says, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. He says, this is acceptable with God. And guys, keep in mind, as Peter's writing this, he's writing to a church that's under severe persecution. They're going through some things. And we already know the world don't like them, no way. And the rank and file doesn't like them. The leadership don't like them. And at this time, there was a king by the name of Nero who was in power. And that emperor, he was real cruel. And he was doing some things that he shouldn't have done, some sinful things, even hurting his own community. And when the community was rising up and coming against him, he put all the blame on the Christians. And look, they already didn't like him. And they started not liking them even that much more. So as, as he's writing to these that are going through, he's writing to us as well in the time where we are. And, and we're going through some things. And we need to keep our eyes on the one who is the prize. And that is Jesus the Christ. Guys, please be prayerful with me as I preach around this sermon series. 
salvation is of the Lord. And Father, as we go forward in this great uh, book, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll touch and bless as you see fit. And Father God, that you would hide me behind your cross. And Father, allow what I say to be words that you have given for this congregation. Father, there will be some that are going through here in this time. And Father, even for our sick and affirmed, that you would touch and that you would bless and that you would minister in the name of Jesus Christ as we pray in his name. In his name alone, amen and amen. Give me one second. I need to make a switch, a big change, real quick. Pay no attention to the empty screen. <laughs> Jump up and sing a song or something. He said, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Quick switch. Guys, as it says in your, in your bulletin, we, we're going to go back to verse 20 of the second chapter of Peter. And, and he reads there, if you would be saved, man. Amen. And he says here, for what glory is it when ye be buffeted, again, when you are punished, for your faults, ye take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. He says, this is acceptable with God. And, and he goes on, and, and he's speaking about it as believers, for, for here unto you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And look, we know that Christ did no wrong while he was on earth. The only thing he actually did was tell the truth. And, and listen, in his time and actually in our time, nobody likes to hear the truth, especially if it's messing with them or, 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 or right in their kitchen or addressing something that they're doing that is wrong. They don't want to hear it. And, and, and we're going to go through just like our Savior went through. It says in verse uh, 22, who did no sin, again speaking about Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And that word guile simply means uh, deceit. And we know there's nothing sinful about Christ. But man, I tell you, when truth hits you in your face or steps on your shoes, it doesn't always feel good. And it's a good thing to acknowledge it as true and to be obedient to it. But when you don't have the spirit living in you, when you don't know God, you don't want to hear the truth. He says in verse 23, who when he was reviled, uh, again speaking about Christ, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges rightly. And, and look, all of Christ's life here on earth, he always said through his earthly ministry, I have come to do the work of him who has sent me. And his father sent him. And regardless of what was going to go down, regardless of what was going to happen, he was going to be obedient to him. And guys, by the way, we're Christians. We belong to Christ. And we're to be obedient to him as well. He goes on in verse 24. Who his own self, it says, bear our sins in his body. And we know he did that. It says, on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, and, and by the way, we should be dead to sins. We should not wake that body back up to the area of sin. It says, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. And, and he's talking about Jesus Christ. And look, he was beaten with many stripes on, on, on occasions almost where he was not recognizable. And it wasn't for his sin and we take it personally, it was for my sin. And by the way, it was for your sin as well, so that we now, from God's perspective, can be seen as having no sin because of the strikes that Christ did and took for us. He says in verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed, for ye were, and, and I love the word were, he's saying past tense. For ye were as sheep going astray. And he 
concludes that we are right now, he said, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our soul. And he's talking about Christ, where before we was estranged from God, we were away in a chasm between us and God, and that chasm was called sin, and, and, and Christ took stripes, took beatings, took whippings, all the way up to death and, and even a burial, but was raised. And because of that, now we were in sin, but now we're children of his light. He goes on in verse 3, um, chapter 3, verse 1. And, and, and though he, it appears he's switching gears, he's still talking about obedience and he's talking about his, uh, God's pecking order. He says, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. And take note, it says your own husbands, not just any man, but your own husbands. And, and he's talking about being submissive. He, he's talking about willingly being submissive. And look, not submissive to be doing sin, not submissive to being abused, but being submissive in regard to him being the, 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 the uh, preacher or the pastor of your home and giving you guided counsel and even direction as he directs his family. He says, likewise, verse 1, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands. It says that any obey not the word. And guys, by the way, here he's talking about husbands that are unsaved. And there are many situations where that happens. Sometimes folk walk into it, their eyes are open, and they think, well, I know he doesn't know the Lord, but I can change him. And I hear that sometimes, but it generally, in fact, it never happens. Only God can change somebody. Or maybe you were both unsaved, and then the wife got saved, and she's still with this husband that unsaved. And he's saying that, look, you can still win them, but I'll win them through you. It says that they may, in fact, let me start at, uh, at, at verse 1 again. It says, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that they may, that if it says, any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And, and guys, take note, he's talking about an unequally yoked marriage where one's saved and one is not. Here he's speaking or highlighting the wives. And, and what he is saying, that you can win them without the word. Now we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, but he's not so much talking about what the wife is saying to the husband, but how she is living in front of the husband, that she's walking as a godly wife, that she's doing her wifely duties, that she's doing what she's supposed to be doing in regard to uh, uh, giving uh, due benevolence as unto the Lord. And he's saying that you can win him that way. I, I know some, some, some families and some wives that are married to unbelievers. And, and what they would do, they would take and put, they make the a husband's wife a lunch every day. And they would take and put a track in there every day, figuring we're going to get him this way. And we're going to bombard him with the truth. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your chaste behavior. He's talking about how you carry yourself, how, how you're being a godly wife and, and being a, a wife that God is proud of or a woman that God is proud of. And he's saying your actions will speak louder than your words. And, and by the way, I've seen that happen as well. I've seen women stay with guys that weren't right. They weren't beating them. They weren't causing them issues. And he's going to get ready to talk about that in a minute. But their lives were lived in such a way that ultimately the Lord blessed the husband into salvation as well. He goes on and even tells them how. He says, while they behold your chaste conversation, and he's talking about your pure or your, your faithful conversation, and it says, coupled with fear, and listen, not trembling at them or fearful of them, but fearful or reverencing of, the, of God. And for that sake, that's why you're there. That's why you're treating them nice. That's why you're treating or, or conducting yourselves as a godly wife in front of them. And, and listen, godly conversation because of the one we serve and we're reverencing him as well. And, and he goes on and, and, and he begins to speak. And, and by the way, verse 2 says... While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And verse 3 he says who, who's adorning. And, and he's actually talking about the wife. 
who's adorning, let it not be, it said, that outward adorning of planting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel, putting on of apparel. And, and he's talking about dressing worldly is what he's talking about. If you want to plait your hair, that's fine. But during that time, a lot of times the, the worldly women and even some of the prostitutes, they would wear gold. They would plait gold in their hair. They wanted to be seen. They were wearing the latest fashion. They were showing off their bodies. And he's saying, no, not worldly, but godly and chaste. Not that you have to wear sackcloth and ashes. That's not what he's saying. You can dress nice, but you don't have to necessarily dress the way of the world or dress provocatively. Amen? Amen? He goes on, verse 4. But let it be, it says, the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. And, and listen, God sees it as a great price. And look, if we do or wives do as, as unto the Lord and they go to please him, it's something going to happen. It's going to happen. There's a verse in, in Proverbs 16 and 7, and it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he will make him even his enemies be at peace with him. And, and listen, if you're in an unequally yoked situation, if you're saved and your, your spouse is not saved, then in reality, he's your enemy from the spiritual. But man, when you walk and work and live to please the Lord, even those that don't like you, even some that hate you, they're going to be at peace with you, not because of you, but because of the God that you serve. And, and in reality, that's all he's saying. In verse 4 again, he said, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the, uh, the sight, which is in the sight of God, a great price. There was a, a, a place I worked one time, and, and this has happened a few times, man. Sometimes you'll see somebody, and you look at them, and you know that they're different. It could be a man or a woman. And there's something different, man, because when God or Christ is on the inside, it actually shows on the outside, and, and it can make somebody beautiful. I don't care what they're wearing, because they are citizens or servants of the Most High God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living inside of you is going to show on the outside even from the physical there's something special something different something beautiful about a Christian that loves the Lord and it shows in how they conduct themselves he says in verse 5 after this manner in the old time the holy woman also who trusted God adorned themselves being in subjection, it says, unto their own husbands. And, and again, under their authority, as God would have it set up to be that way, he's not a, 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 a taskmaster, he's not whipping on you, he's not beating on you. And by the way, he's not better than you, but that's God's pecking order. And for a woman to willingly come under a man that way can only be done through Christ. He says in verse 6, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are. And by the way, Abraham is the father of faith. Indeed, she was the mother of faith. It says, as long as you do well. And he ends verse 6. Look what he says. And are not afraid with any amazement. And listen, what he's saying is that if you can stay there and live in peace, He's not telling you to take a whipping. If you got an abusive husband, you need to get out of there. And God would honor that as well. But he's saying that if you can live there in peace, you're not being abused, you're not pushed or being forced to do and live sinfully. He said it's a good thing to stay there, live godly, let Christ shine through you, and as long as he's not laying hands on you in regard to whippings, that it's going to work out, and God's going to honor that. One way, shape, or form. He says in verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, and, and by the way, <laughs> a lot of times when I get to this verse, and there's a, a bunch of husbands and wives, when, when you get to this part, or, or if you're talking about the wives, the husbands perk up, 
And then when you start talking about the husbands, the wives generally perk up because they want to hear what, what God has to say about them as well. He says, likewise, ye husbands. He says, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, and as being, it says, heirs together of the grace of life. And look what he's saying is that, well, first and foremost, he says that, that we're to live with our wives according to knowledge. Biblical knowledge, yes. But we also need to know our wives. Guys, the only way I can know this book is to read it and study it. I, I, I work on old cars. The only way I know how to work on old cars is because I've read about them and I study them and I've learned them. The only way I can know my wife is to study her and to know her ways, her, her comings in and, and her goings out. There, there, there were times in, in our early earlier marriage, I mean, after we came out of living in sin, and, and, and I never actually studied my wife. I, I kind of categorized women, well, they're this way or, or, or that way, but God had me to learn my particular wife and how she was bent and how she was put together. And, and in many cases, I, I, it seemed like we would be going along real good and, and then all of a sudden, I would, I would say, hey, how you doing? A joke with her. And, and she would snap back at me. I'm like, well, what did I do? I didn't do anything. And, and I noticed that this would happen. And, and, and after a while, she, she helped me with that. And, and she said, you need to know that at certain times of the month, I'm not always up and upbeat and, and raring to go. And I always feel like joking. And, and she said toward the end of the month or, or the beginning of the month that, that, that sometimes I'm tired, more tired than I am in other times. So if I would say something to her, and, and maybe she gave me a snappy answer, I, I would recognize that what time of the month it was. I would make that part of my ministry toward her. And, and so it helped me to know how to minister to her that at certain times and certain seasons, she was not always the same. But I had to learn that. I didn't know that. I thought it was me doing something. And it probably was. But besides the point, I needed to learn her bet and how she was. And guys, what I have found that over the years, we've been together a long time. And the Bible said the two have become one. That I take note that if she's dragging for whatever reason a certain time, I'm dragging as well. Not as bad, but I am. Sometimes I'm irritable for no particular reason because the two really have become one. And, and I take note of that, and, and I love that because God has truly made us one vessel. But he said that we're to study our wives, that we should know them. In fact, verse 7 said, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. In other words, live with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel. And, and listen, I had to learn that as well. And not, it, yes, but a men are generally physically stronger, but, uh, but wives or women most times will have more emotional or deal more with their emotions than men do. I mean, I'll, I'll see something in, in, in uh, maybe a movie and I look, I say, hmm, oh yeah, hmm, that's something. And I'm going on in my way. But, but maybe my wife is lingering there and, and it's actually bothering her. And, and, and I used to say to myself, What's wrong with her? But they're dealing from a different place than men. They're not men. They were made that way. They were made to be emotional. They were made to be more caring. Sometimes she'll say, did you call your brother this month? I said, no, nah, nah, I didn't call him. I'll get around. You didn't need to call me. I mean, it, it, she, really, it, she really wants me to call him. Or did you wish him a happy birthday? They deal, women deal more from that than what men does. And I love that. Because she keeps me straight that way. Did you send your sister a birthday card? Did you do this? Did you do that? And, and, and it makes me look good because somebody will say, oh man, thank you for the card. In reality, if she didn't tell me, I probably would have never sent it. I'm not as sensitive that way. And they are sensitive. But God had made them that way and made us this way. And when we come together, it makes one whole marriage or one whole person. It says, likewise, verse 7, husbands, Dwell with your wives according to knowledge, uh, 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 giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as unto heir or being heirs together of the grace of life. And he says at the very end of verse 7, 
that your prayers be not hindered. In other words, I need to know my wife's ins and outs. I need to know her ups and downs. I need to know how she is. And listen, there are times when I know she's upset, and I haven't even said that. I can just see it. I can sense it. And God has given me that as well. And if you're married, he's given that to you. And you need to learn about these things. And Frank, keeps you out of a lot of trouble, too. If you... <laughs> he said, okay. Yeah, as you learn these things that we should and, and he said that your prayers be not hindered and look if, if, I'm, if I'm dealing with my wife in ignorance I don't need my prayers hindered there, there are a lot of things that can hinder my prayers that does not need to be one I need to be sensitive to her I need to be sensitive to her needs I need to understand if she's upset or, or, or why she's upset or, or, or wanting to find out why she's upset and, and because not only because I don't want my prayers hindered but she is my help me she's the closest one to me apart from the Lord listen I, I, I came from my mother and father and we have married and now the two have become one she is now my family, even more so than my children, I need to make sure she's okay. Because God put her in my charge. And he has said that, look, I am the priest of my home, and I better make sure my church, which is my first ministry, I better make sure that it's okay. Because if it's not when God looks at me like he looked for Adam when they had sinned, and, and listen, even though Eve was in the transgression first, at God came along and said, Adam, where art thou? Because if my home is in disarray and out of order, it's my fault. Either I let something go, either I didn't recognize something, it's still my fault, and God's going to come to me, and I need to make sure I'm right in regard to my first ministry, which is my home. He says in verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion, having compassion one of another. It says, love as brethren. He said, be pitiful. And listen, it's not talking about if your wife said, man, you sure are pitiful. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that we're to be pitiful, or some versions will say tenderhearted, and we ought to be. It said, be courteous. And look, in other words, we're to treat one another as family because, guys, we are family. And, and listen, Christ's blood proves it. And, and, and the DNA of my blood naturally is one thing, but the DNA of my blood spiritually is going to be linked to yours. And the proof of that pudding is that we will all be in heaven together as believers because of the finished works and the shed work uh, works of Jesus and shed blood of Jesus Christ. He shed that blood for me. He shed it for you. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission. And without me believing on that shed blood, I can never see heaven. And because I believe on that shed blood, and you believe on that shed blood, and we have been blessed to be the church, we are one family in Christ. And that's how God sees us. Amen. He says in verse 8, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one for another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. He says in verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. He said, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. And listen, he said we're called to go through some things sometimes, and he said that we're called in, in regard to this as well, that we are to be children of the Most High God and treat each other, treat one another as such. In other words, we're to live right, and the blessings of God will find you. A lot of times folks are saying, I'm, I'm looking for my blessing, or I need God to bless me. Look, to bless me. Look, just simply live right. Do what he's telling you to do and they're going to find you. They will. And by the way, you woke up this morning. It wasn't because of your own efforts. You didn't keep yourself. God woke, woke you up. Had everything flowing all through your body and woke you up at a specific time and you walked here and you drove here and there are some that want to be here and they can't be here and we're blessed. 
without nothing else being put on top of that. In verse 10 it says, For he that will love life and see good days, it says, Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that speak guile. In other words, he's saying that look, and that guy was those conniving ways and, and trying to hook and crook things. He said, look, if you want your life to go well, then do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. In other words, be obedient to me. And he says in verse 11, let him eschew evil. In other words, avoid evil and do good and let him seek peace and ensue it. In other words, man, what we do here on this earth, and sometimes we don't think it's a big deal, but if we're not doing right, your life is not going to go as well as it could have gone. And there are a lot of folk that are struggling in this life, going through things in this life, can't figure out how come I can't get this thing called life on track, and could it be that you're simply not doing what God has called you to do? And look, I've been there earlier in my Christian career. I just figured I'm in Christ and I go to church. I, I, I should be okay. I can still do whatever I want. No. He wants you to do what he wants you to do and to live by his will and his will alone. We don't do our own thing. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. And look, sometimes it's, it, it, it might, you might see it as a hassle. You might see it as tough. You might say it's hard. But man, everything God asks us to do, it really is for our goodness or for our betterment. And ultimately, he will get the glory out of it. And everything he asks me to do, even though I can't see how this is going to uh, uh, be good for me, in the end, it always is good for me. And it's always better than what I had planned for myself. In verse 12, he says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. So he's talking about the church that God hears our prayers and will answer our prayers and, and listen, either yes, no, and sometimes wait, but he will always answer the prayers of the righteous and if you know him, he will answer. But the verse don't end there, it keeps going. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And by the way, even as a Christian, if you're walking in darkness, don't expect to pray and get an answer until you get that right with our Lord. He don't play games. Surely don't play favors. And for his children, that's his favorite. And he's going to make sure that we're going to do right by him. And by the way, there's an easy way. Simply be obedient when he says... <laughs> But there's also a hard way that we're going to go ahead and rock, walk up the rough side of the mountain. Yeah, I hear the Lord. I'm, I'll get back to it. Yeah, okay. And you wonder why life is so hard for you on this side. He says in verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is is against them that do evil. Take a stand on righteousness. Don't just say you love the Lord. Let it show in your conduct, in your walk, in your talk. Don't just say you love him. Show that you love him in every aspect of your life. And he says that you will be blessed. Amen. Guys, I'm going to close there as we go into our communion service. And I'm going to pray now. And I'm going to ask the Lord to bless these elements and even to touch and bless our hearts in regard to what we're getting ready to look at in Corinthians. And as we prepare ourselves to remember the finished works of Jesus Christ. And Father, as we close out this sermon here and Lord, we go into our communion service, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll touch and bless in a mighty and a special way. Father, help us understand the importance of what we're about to do, Father God. We know that these, these elements are simply unsweetened juice and, and unleavened bread, but Father, they're natural products. But we ask that you would bless them so we can use them for a supernatural purpose, and that is to remember the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
And Father, as we take a moment and pray and make sure that we're right in our hearts to partake in these elements, I pray that anything that's, Lord, that's unlike you, that we need to bring to the uh, prayer table, that you'll remind us of that so that we can get cleansed and be able to partake of these elements. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, we say yes to your will and to your way as we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment and let's make sure our slate is clean and clear so that we can partake of these elements. Amen.